All right. So last night, I unfortunately had to watch the second Republican primary debate, and it was just an absolute shit show from top to bottom, just a complete nightmare of a debate. I don't even know if you could really call it a debate because half the time they were agreeing with each other on their demented agenda. The other half the time they were basically just yelling over each other about utter nonsense. So I'm going to show you guys a bunch of different clips here first, just to give you guys the basic rundown of the winners and losers of this debate, the uh, winners or or winner, I guess I should say, of this debate, if anybody, I would say is probably Donald Trump, even though he didn't even show up to the debate, which is, you know, obviously pathetic on the one hand, because he should be participating in these debates, you know, he's not a king, he doesn't just get to be anointed, but, um, you know, he's ahead by significant margins in the aggregate polling, it's not as if this is a close race, and it looks like he actually is, politically at least, making the right decision to not go to these debates, because he's maintaining his solid lead, none of these other candidates are making any real uh, headway or breakthroughs or anything like that. And especially after watching this second debate, I think, if anything, probably the rest of these candidates' numbers may even go down a little bit. And um, so that's your, you know, that's your rundown on the winners, I guess, the one guy who didn't show up to the debate. And uh, the losers, at least in my mind, would be uh, me and everybody else who decided to actually watch this thing. Okay, so there you have it, the winners and losers of this debate. So now I just want to go ahead and get into some of the clips that, uh, you know, I thought stood out in this. I think this one, again, with all the shouting over each other and the chaos that was this debate. Uh, this one is pretty much a good synopsis, so if you want to just dip out of the video right after I play this, you'll probably just get the gist of how much substance there was in this. So let's go ahead and see how the debate started out. The next question is for Governor DeSantis. Where's how we get done in Washington? We must find a way Can we please respect the time? Yeah, so uh, that wasn't like an audio glitch. That wasn't on my end. I'm not doing any editing here or anything. That was just like a clip from the debate where you have six, seven people, I don't know, talking directly over each other. Nobody can tell what anybody is saying. Just complete, uh, you know, utter nonsense. And on top of that, I mean, the moderators in this, they did have some decent questions. Uh, you know, some of them that you're going to watch in this video were actually framed from like, like a, a pretty left-wing perspective. But on the other hand, they weren't really asking questions that would number one, actually get some disagreement between these candidates and like figure out pressure points to get them to argue directly with each other on, on meaningful policy issues. And then on top of that, the moderators weren't really getting control of this debate at any point throughout the entirety of it. So there you have it. There's your uh, basic synopsis of how this entire night went. Now we're going to jump over to uh, good old Mike Pence here, who had a bizarre statement that was basically followed after uh, Chris Christie bizarrely critiqued Joe Biden because his, his wife is obviously Jill Biden, who has a teaching background, and uh, he said, you know, the man in the White House or whatever is, is sleeping with someone who's a member of the teachers union, and that was his way of attacking unions and attacking the teachers union specifically, and so Mike Pence, his wheels are turning in his head, and he decides to uh, come up with My this, wife, uh, uh, this disgusting uh, uh, comeback, I guess you could call it. Uh, isn't a member of the teachers union, but I got to admit, I've, I've been sleeping with a teacher for 38 years, and um, so full disclosure. All right. So, uh, you know, there you go. Now you have that image in your head. You're welcome. Uh, you know, terrible, just, just absolutely terrible stuff. We also had a great uh, sort of like Jeb Bush-esque uh, please clap moment here from Mike Pence where he, he tried to land a zinger. Let's go ahead and listen to this one. Said, Joe Biden doesn't belong on a picket line. He belongs on the unemployment line. <laughs> Got him, I guess. <laughs> I guess. I mean, it's a real stretch there. Now, you know, obviously I gave a little bit of credit for uh, Joe Biden actually going to the picket line while Donald Trump was off doing his, uh, you know, fake uh, virtue signal fest with a bunch of non-union workers at a non-union plant that was 20 miles away from the nearest picket line and all of that good stuff. So I gave Joe Biden a little bit of credit for that. They did have some decent questions at the top of this debate, uh, right to start out the gate. And, um, you know, they were basically asking them on their position on the UAW strike on unions generally. Every single candidate, I kid you not, you know, didn't even reference the actual demands of the UAW or why they're on strike. They all basically deflected. Some of them, I think, even brought up, like, the border or whatever and, uh, you know, brought up just, like, general support, I guess, for workers broadly, but not unions. And some of them just outright came out and uh, attacked unions um, as a part of that. So it should give you a good indication in terms of where they stand. And uh, certainly they do not stand on the side of labor. Uh, we also had this absolute 
gem where Chris Christie also had sort of a please clap moment similar to Mike Pence except this one was maybe even uh, maybe worse than that one that Mike Pence just landed there uh, where he is he's going to attack the former president Donald Trump the leading candidate who's obviously not on the stage but he's gonna speak to him directly through the camera lens Donald Trump should be here to answer for that but he's not and I want to look at that camera right now and tell you Donald I know you're watching you can't help yourself I know you're watching okay and you're not here tonight not because of polls and not because of your indictments. You're not here tonight because you're afraid of being on the stage and defending your record. You're ducking these things. And let me tell you what's gonna happen. You keep doing that, no one up here is gonna call you Donald Trump anymore. We're gonna call you Donald Duck. <laughs> His face here at the end gets me every time. This has already, I guess, become sort of like a meme, but I mean, come on, man. Come on. You almost had it. You almost had it there. He, he just had to stick the landing. You know, the whole run up to that line that he's clearly been practicing in the mirror for days and days leading up to this, right? You know, you just had to sort of stop before the Donald Duck line, okay? And maybe that would have landed. You just say, you know, you're being a coward. You're you're not willing to come up here and defend your record or defend your policy agenda. You're being, you know, uh, you're being gutless. You're trying to duck these debates and you could have just left it at that and it would have been a great moment right but then he decides to just look down the barrel of the camera and uh, deliver his his now I guess infamous Donald Duck critique of uh, the former president Donald Trump and so now I want to get to uh, an another just fantastically substantive moment in this debate where Nikki Haley and uh, Tim Scott who I guess Tim Scott was told by some of his advisors after the first debate where he was coming off pretty soft that hey man you need to step it up you need to try to land some shots and I guess he decided to try to land shots over expensive curtains that Nikki Haley was somewhat involved in so anyways here's the curtain portion of the debate 10 cents on this gallon in South Carolina as the UN ambassador you literally bring it put $50,000 on <laughs> curtains and a 15 million dollar subsidized location Next. You got bad information. First of all, I fought the gas tax in South Carolina multiple times against the just establishment. Go to you, just go to YouTube. Against the establishment. You, just go to and YouTube you want to know what that yourself. 10 cent yep. was? When they wouldn't pass the gas tax, the establishment and the companies wanted me to do it so much that I said the only way I will Here's pass what it you have if you will give us three. All you have to do is go watch Nikki Haley on YouTube. If you will give me three times the deduction in income tax, then I will look at your gas so tax, you said, which yes, is why it didn't would, happen. Secondly, secondly, on the 50 million curtains, yes. do your yes. homework, Tim, because Obama bought those curtains. Did you send them back? It's in the press. Did you send them back? It's the State Department. Did you send them, back? You send them back? You're the one that works in Congress. Oh, my gosh. You get it. You time. hung them on your, your, your curtains. I, they your were curtains. there before I even showed up at the residence. You here's, are scrapping. A, you a, are scrapping. I'm not scrapping. What are we doing? What are we doing? This is what I was spending my night last night doing, listening to this kind of shit, okay? Kind of get a little bit of my frustration there, right? Okay, another clip that we have here. Mike Pence kind of, you know, going with a classic move here that was uh, very consistent throughout the entire night where uh, GOP candidates just basically are airboxing with opponents or policies that don't exist, that have not been implemented whatsoever. So here we got Mike Pence being asked a question, and I don't remember exactly how they framed this question. It was, it was unrelated to his answer that he's going to give here. But here's Mike Pence calling to repeal the Green New Deal, okay, which... You know, surprise, surprise, has not actually been implemented. Okay, so let's listen to what he has to say here. ...of General Motors, Ford, and Stellantis make 336 times the number of rank and, the, uh, member, number of rank and file workers. That's just part of a, work, a wider income inequality trend in the country. The richest 1% now controls one-fifth of all income. Vice President Pence, last week you said you side with American workers... But you also support how these companies operate. Which is it? Okay, so again, this was a, what I was referencing earlier where they were actually asking some decent questions, right? That's a fantastic question that he, he just asked there, right? I would have tweaked a couple things, right? But that's a solid question. Now, let's go ahead and hear because just keep that the way that he just asked that question in mind because Mike Pence's answer is going to have nothing to do with what that question was. Well, thank you for the question. I want to thank uh, Univision and Fox Business for assembling such a wonderful forum. Look, I do disagree with something Tim Scott just said. Joe Biden doesn't belong on a picket line. He belongs on the unemployment line. <laughs> I mean, look, I'm, I'm from the second leading manufacturing state in the country per capita. I was governor of the state of Indiana. 
We brought 12,000 factories back to America during our administration. I, I know something about manufacturing. And I got to tell you, while, uh, while the union bosses are talking about class warfare and talking about disparity in wages, I, I have to tell you, I really believe what's driving that is that Bidenomics has failed. Wages are not keeping up with inflation. Auto workers and all American workers are feeling it. And families are struggling in this economy. And Joe Biden's Green New Deal agenda is good for Beijing and bad for Detroit. We all okay, so, I mean, again, the question was very specific. Okay, we're talking about the UAW workers who are out on strike right now. The question is, do you stand with what they're asking for or do you stand with the bosses in this equation? Very simple question, okay? You can stand with the bosses, stand with the workers, fine. Just make it clear exactly what you're saying here. And he just completely deflects to talking about what? General support for manufacturing and general support for auto workers. And, oh, how are you going to deliver that support for auto workers, right? Because it's certainly not supporting the union, obviously, right? The the, you know, the entity that actually represents democratically the workers that you're talking about here. So if it's not supporting the workers uh, directly through the union, what is it? Okay. And his response is to basically say, uh, it's Bidenomics fault, right? It's because of all of this crazy socialist spending that led to inflation, which it didn't, by the way, corporate greed was the main driver of inflation. Okay. Corporate greed, the same corporations who he is implicitly defending right now. And so by attacking Bidenomics or whatever, right, which I'm not even like a fan of Bidenomics, but what he's really saying here is he's attacking attacking government spending. He wants to slash social programs that benefit working class families in order to implement the classic Reaganomics. They're literally in the, the like Ronald Reagan library here, okay, for this debate, all right? And he's basically talking about re-implementing, you know, stricter Reaganomic principles, trickle-down economic principles that do nothing but serve to expand the wealth of the billionaire class and fuck over workers at every single chance, okay? So that's what he's talking about there. And then brings up just... Out of nowhere, the Green New Deal agenda? What are we talking about? What are we talking about, Mike? Okay, Joe Biden, first of all, was never a supporter of the Green New Deal, number one. Number two, we just had the Inflation Reduction Act, okay? I guess that's the Green New Deal agenda that he's referring to here. Here's how I would characterize the Green, uh, the uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, right? One of the people who had the most, uh, the most significant influence over the Inflation Reduction Act, which was this historic investment in climate change that's like a tiny fraction of what we're spending on our military budget every single year, no, we're close to what we need to actually address the issue. Joe Manchin, the politician who had a significant degree of sway in how this uh, this bill, this climate bill was written, okay? He recently, just a couple days ago, wrote an op-ed where he was describing that this bill is enabling historic levels of fossil fuel production in the United States of America, okay? So historic levels of fossil fuel production in the United States of America under the Biden administration, in Mike Pence's line, somehow does a loop-de-loop -loop and hold, you know, and, and folds over into somehow now it's the Green New Deal. It's the radical socialist AOC Bernie-backed Green New Deal agenda, okay? Come on, Mike. I mean, let's let's live in reality a little bit, please, just a little bit for a second here. Uh, we also had, of course, Tim Scott pulling out some great uh, some great moves here. He says that uh, the Great Society was harder to survive than slavery. Let me say that again. The Great Society, okay, Lyndon B. Johnson's Great Society, okay, of some social programs, right, was harder to survive than slavery for Black Americans. All right, that was a real thing that he said there. All right, not going to play all of these clips. Obviously, I have so many different things, but some of these I just wanted to touch on real quick. DeSantis dismisses his own history standards as a hoax. Okay, I actually do want to play this because I can give you guys a little bit more context on the other side of this. Let's hear when he's confronted with this this statement that he made that I covered on this channel a couple months back where he basically was saying, you know, slave, you know, slaves at the time, they learned some skills that were beneficial to them and yada, yada, yada. This new black history curriculum says, quote, slaves develop skills which in some instances could be applied for their personal benefit. You have said, Slaves develop skills in spite of slavery, not because of it. But many are still hurt. For the sentence of slaves, this is personal. What is your message to them? So first of all, that's a hoax that was perpetrated by Kamala Harris. Uh, we are not gonna be Just doing that. Okay, 
So it's a hoax <laughs> perpetrated by Kamala Harris. I mean, I went over this at the time that he made those statements and changed the Florida curriculum uh, to include this. And he went on after this, that, that portion that it just cut off there, right? After saying that it's a hoax, he went on to say like, oh, we have this, this you know, historic agenda in, in Florida for our curriculum that was written by descendants of slaves or something like that. And it's all factual. It's all up and down. You know, it's buttoned up. It's, it's, it's accurate and all of that good stuff. And I, as I talked about a couple of months ago when he first made that move, was if you actually go and you look through the details of the examples of people or slaves, former slaves, who learned skills from slavery or personally got some benefit from slavery that translated later in their life, if you look example by example, I'm not even kidding, there were like 12 different examples and like nine of them were people who were never even slaves in the first place, okay? So it was like completely detached from anything historical, anything factual, and obviously just an absurd argument at face value. But there was Ron DeSantis being, I guess, confronted on that, but just immediately deflecting. Um, you also had this uh, this amazing moment where Ron DeSantis was confronted with the fact that in Florida, the health insurance situation is worse than almost anywhere in the country. And let's hear a little bit of his response on this. And the doctor-patient relationship. Governor, why is your record in Florida on insurance worse than the national average? It's not, it's, our, our state's a dynamic state. We've got, we've got a lot of uh, folks that come. Of course, we've had a population boom. We also don't have uh, a lot of welfare benefits in Florida. You know, we're basically say we want to, this is a field of dreams. You can do well in the state, but we're not going to be like California and have massive numbers of people um, on government programs without work requirements. We believe you work and you got to do that. And so that goes for all the welfare benefits. Okay, so he's directly confronted with the fact that his, you know, uh, sort of like anti-welfare uh, or, uh, you know, uh, pro like free market agenda in Florida and gutting all of these social programs for poor and working class people. He's confronted with the fact that that has put Florida, which is one of the largest states in the country, one of the wealthiest states in the country, uh, below the national average in terms of health insurance coverage for their citizens. All right, and his response is to basically say, you know, you, you can take it or leave it, you know, working class people, poor people, if you're struggling to get insurance, then you can basically just kick rocks. I mean, that's his, that's his justification there. So, I mean, again, you know, take that, what you, take that with what you will. That's what uh, Ron DeSantis and basically every other Republican sort of agrees with. That's their policy agenda. We also had some moments here. I won't, I won't make you guys sit through uh, some of the Burger mania. I know there's not a lot of other Burgum heads out there like me, uh, but Burgum had some moments where he was stepping into the debate. And uh, at one point, the moderator even had to tell him to uh, stop talking or she was going to shut off his mic. But uh, he was basically, Every single answer that he gives circles back to free market economics, and he thinks that every problem is caused by government spending and government regulations and involvements within the markets. So there's a little bit of Doug Burgum. You know, you love to see him still on the debate stage since uh, our man Asa Hutchinson didn't make the cut this time. Absolutely tragic. Uh, we also had uh, a couple moments here where uh, Nikki Haley, Vivek, who seemed to have like a seething hatred for one another, got into it. So let's hear here from uh, 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 Nikki Haley going after Vivek. <laughs> This is infuriating because TikTok is one of the most dangerous social media apps yes, that we could have. And what you've got, I honestly, every time I hear you, I feel a little bit dumber for what you say hmm. because I can't believe. You know okay, I mean, that might be the one thing that she or anybody on that stage said the entire night that I actually agree with. I, I do feel dumber every time that I hear Vivek speak, but that also applies to you, Nikki. Sorry. Okay, that's just how it works. Um, we also had a, a little moment here where, similar to Chris Christie, when he was going after Donald Duck, um, where uh, Ron. Ron DeSantis called out Donald Trump and he said, you know who else is missing in action? He was calling out Biden and uh, he says, Donald Trump, he's also missing in action. He won't come up on the debate stage. So a little bit of shots thrown at Trump. Again, you're down by like 50 points at this point. So I don't really know what we're doing all of this for. I don't know if you think that these kinds of sort of like milk toast attacks are going to be enough to, uh, you know, pull people away from Trump and towards you. It's not, it's not going to work out that way, buddy. Um, we also had a Ron DeSantis when they were having this crime portion of the debate who said, this Los Angeles and San Francisco just being in Southern California over the last couple of days my wife and I have met three people who have been mugged on the street and that would have never happened 10 or 20 years ago 
Right, okay, so apparently violent crime didn't exist 20 years ago. Certainly don't go look at the statistics showing that uh, violent crime was significantly higher 20 years ago than it is right now. Don't look at the statistics. Just take his, uh, his, his I guess, anecdote here of, of three people. I don't know if he's saying that he met three random people who happened to be mugged or he was going there for like some sort of an event and he, he was specifically looking for people who had been mugged. Not exactly sure what the situation was there. Um, and then I'll, I'll finish off here, which was one of the most insane portions of this debate, but basically just characterizes the entirety of it. Um, again, where they didn't, they don't seem to be able to listen to a question and then directly answer the question straight up. They have to like dance around it or deflect away from it to talking about things they're more comfortable around, like the border or something. So here we have Mike Pence, who was asked a very, very specific question about Obamacare and whether or not he would repeal and replace Obamacare or just more generally, what's your health care policy? This was his response. Look, I'm someone that believes that justice delayed is justice denied. And as a father of three, as a grandfather of three beautiful little girls, I'm, I am sick and tired of these mass shootings happening in the United States of America. And if I'm president of the United States, I'm going to go to the Congress of the United States, and we're going to pass a federal expedited death penalty for anyone involved in a mass shooting so that they, they will meet their fate in months, not years. It is unconscionable that the, the, uh, the Parkland shooter, Ron, is actually going to spend the rest of his life behind bars in Florida. Okay. So, I mean, I'm not even kidding. I mean, as, as pointed out here by the recount, former uh, Vice President Mike Pence calls for deterring mass shooters by uh, passing a federal law expediting the death penalty for perpetrators, half of whom die in their attacks, which I'll circle back around to that here in a second. The question was whether Obamacare is here to stay. I mean, this was what I was watching last night. You have a question about healthcare policy, right? A very specific question. This wasn't like up in the air. And his response is to say, we need to do more death penalties? What? What the fuck are we doing? What, what is happening? I felt like I was like in like a dream world last night because they're, they're, the, the questions that are being asked, the statements that are following them, they're not matching up in any way, shape or form. OK, and on top of that, even just if I wanted to take him seriously here for a second, you, expediting the death penalty, you think that the way to stop mass shootings in this country doesn't have anything to do with the guns, doesn't have anything to do with the fact that we don't have universal health care or mental, mental health care resources for people who are struggling or red flag laws or anything like that. Nothing to do with that, okay? The, the way that we actually prevent mass shootings from happening is by what? Taking the death penalty from a year or two years down the line to a couple of months and that's going to somehow deter mass shooters who, by the way, as they point out here, frequently have suicidal tendencies anyways and plan to die in the attacks that they are doing i mean it's just complete nonsense so i mean there you go there were obviously uh you know a lot of other portions of this debate that i could have shown you we had some you know examples of uh republicans calling to uh, invade mexico and how they wanted to militarize the border of course the classics uh we had some ukraine stuff we had some abortion stuff that i didn't necessarily get to in this video but it's nothing new it's nothing that you don't already know about these people and i just wanted to lay out some of those you know goofy clips wild clips you know insane clips uh for you guys to give you a perspective just a reminder in terms of who these people are what they stand for okay because some Sometimes I know, like, I, I tend to, you know, whenever I'm covering Democrats and stuff, I'm, I'm very critical of Democrats, and I think that's a good thing, and um, there's lots of reasons to be critical of Biden, there's lots of reasons to be critical of many other corporate Democrats, but sometimes when I when I watch something like this, and you hear Republicans fighting with other Republicans on trying to out-Republican each other, you just, like, are taken into an entirely different mind space, and I'm like, I literally do not agree with a single thing that any of these people said. Any of the things that they stand for, any of their principles, their sense of, of morality, uh, of morality, of justice, none of the policies that they're pro proposing, the direction that they want to take this country. I'm like, I, I can't even put myself in the mindset of, of aligning with them in virtually any way, shape or form. Maybe there's some crossover on some very specific issues, but in terms of Republican politicians, because I don't think this applies to voters. I think there's a lot that me and, you know, an average normie Republican voter could probably agree on. But in terms of 
these politicians, there's just nothing redeemable about them, right? With all my critiques of Democrats and shit, you know, at least like they'll sometimes pretend to be on the right side of things. At least like they'll virtue signal and, you know, Joe Biden, oh, I, I support the public option, right? And it's like, okay, well, I know you don't. And I know that you're not really going to fight for that. Oh, I support the $15 minimum wage. Okay. I know that that's a lie and that you're not going to fight for it, but at least you're like pretending to be on the right side of things with them. It's like, no, we're, we're not even pretending to be on the right side of anything. We're just going full on demon mode. Okay. So there you go. There's your recap. Uh, you know, again, rest in peace to anybody who had to sit through this, including myself. Uh, I'm going to need to go take a nap or something. Had to stay up la late last night. Can't believe I had to do that in order to watch this shit show. But, uh, there you go. The Republican party, you know, all of these different candidates basically fighting for who is going to come in second place to Donald Trump. Everyone is saying good politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me, everyone is saying.